Hey, good morning. Um, you know, every country uh, typically has a defining metaphor or narrative that describes that country. For instance, um, when we look at, a, you know, kind of an empire like Rome back in history, Rome had a defining narrative or metaphor, and it would be glory. That's kind of what defined Rome, right? That would be the cry when they would go into battle for the glory of Rome. And then typically you usually have structures or statues or memorials that kind of define a nation's narrative. So Rome would have like this huge Colosseum, right? This glorious thing. Or um, maybe you get a country like Greece, another ancient empire, the Greek empire, and their metaphor or narrative for who they are as a people, unlike Rome's glory, uh, Greeks would be knowledge. That would be kind of the, the metaphor that defines them. And so as a result, they would have like Plato's Academy, which was kind of the, the precedent for our university system, uh, at least in some ways. And then maybe um, for a country like Japan that's been around a really long time. You know, their defining metaphor would probably be something like honor, and you've got, you know, uh, people like the samurai who operate on a code of honor and those kinds of things. Well, for the United States, if we were to think about a defining metaphor for us, first of all, uh, a defining narrative or a metaphor for a country is probably something that comes over a really long period of time, and we are a very, very young nation. But if I were going to, and this is just me personally, you don't have to write it down, it's not, may not even be right, but generally speaking, if we were gonna describe the United States with a metaphor or a narrative, I think maybe the word I would use would be liberty. Um, liberty is something that you find in all of our founding documents over and over, and some of the speeches from the founding fathers, they're continuing to go to this idea of the cause of liberty. And typically, when you uh, hear uh, them talk about what the, what the real initiation for the start of our country was, it had to do with liberty or freedom. And so we've got structures in our country that help to support that, don't we? In New York Harbor, we have the statue of? Yeah, this is participatory. You can, statue of? <laughs> right, thanks. <laughs> and then in Philadelphia, we've got a little thing that swings back and forth, or could, you know, it's got a crack in it. What's it called? Liberty Bell, Liberty Bell right. You guys did awesome in school, right? You got those two questions. Um, what's interesting is this, this, this idea of liberty is not new to America. Even though maybe it might be for us the defining narrative of who we are as a country, don't lose sight of the fact that this narrative of liberty is something that long preceded us. In fact, you can kind of understand that and prove it because what you have on the Liberty Bell itself is you have an inscription from an ancient document. And here's what it says. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof. Some of you may have seen that before and you're going, yeah, where did that really come from? Hold it, Leviticus. I told you Leviticus was everywhere, people. When I started this, Leviticus is everywhere. In fact, it's from Leviticus 25, which is going to be our text for today. You can see how I put that together, that nice little segue, right? So it's uh, Leviticus 25, that's our text for today, and we'll see it in just a few minutes uh, in our text. As you're turning there uh, to the 25th chapter of Leviticus, hopefully you've got a Bible in front of you. If you don't, I encourage you to, uh, to grab one in the seat backs in front of you, or if you're in the East Worship Center, um, they can, you can find them in there. Some guys can help pass those out if you need one, just make yourself known. Um, don't do cartwheels or anything, but just kind of say, hey, I need a Bible. Um, if you have a Bible that you own, I encourage you to bring it with you on Sunday morning. Some of you say, well, you show it to us on the screens. I know, but I want you to have it in your possession, and I want you to learn how to use it, and I want you to have it so that you don't feel so uh, much like a stranger with it when you're by yourself in your room with it, and you're kind of going, I'm not sure if I, I don't know. I don't know if I know you. I'm not really sure. I'm scared of you. I don't want that. I want the Bible to become your friend. It travels with you Sundays. You open it up here. You know how to work it. You know how to read you know, all those kinds of things you can, all right, you with me? Yes. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this, bring your Bible, yeah. <laughs> right? Bring it, bring it. Bring it. All right, so now that you've had a little bit of time that I've killed for you to find Leviticus chapter 25, 
I wanna remind you that the book of Leviticus is written as a document to a people who have just come out of the bondage of Egypt, right? These are a people that God is commissioning to be people that are distinct so that the nations of the world might see that they serve a distinctive God, a God that's not like the gods of the pagan nations around them, but he is the one true God. Not only is Yahweh the God of Israel, but he's the God of everything. And so he wants this people to be distinct because he himself is distinct. In other words, we might say it this way. He wants his people to be holy because he himself is holy. So that's the idea that we get. And so God uses a number of things built into the life of Israel to paint a picture to the nations of his distinction. He also shows his heart and his character through his people to the nations by what he asks them to do as a distinctive people. And Leviticus 25 is one of those beautiful pictures of God asking his people to be distinct in very unique ways so that the nations around might see the heart and the character of who he is. So pick up with me in verse number one of Leviticus chapter 25. It says these words. The Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I am going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath of rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, your manservant and maidservant, and the hired worker and temporary resident who live among you, as well as your livestock and wild animals in your land. Whatever the land produces may be eaten. So pause here. This is the idea of the Sabbath year. Now, most of you are familiar with the idea of a Sabbath day that God gave to Israel, right? So on the first day of the week, they are to cease, you know, I mean, first day of the week, Saturday, right? This day, one in seven, that is supposed to be a ceasing from labor and enjoying the reality of all that God is. To know God and to worship God and to reflect on God and to learn to trust God and that we don't have to work ourselves into oblivion to somehow provide for ourselves. God's saying, take it easy. I'm providing for you. Relax and reflect on the glory of who I am. So you know that that was built into the character of who they were supposed to be as a people. One day a week set aside to rest that was built on the paradigm of what God did in creation, right? Now God says, I want you to do this as a people. I know you're working your fields and you're working your lands and all that stuff, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to do that for six years. But on year seven, nothing. Don't plant, don't harvest, Leave the land alone and let it rest. Now, some of you are doing exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, that sounds awesome. But um, just uh, checking in with you, Lord. Um, how are we supposed to eat? I mean, because like, uh, you know, we pretty much, we don't have a Wegmans. We are Wegmans. We make our own stuff, right? We've got our own stuff. So what are we supposed to do? Well, uh, interestingly enough, I know that would be our question. Well, it was their question too. Look in verse 18, God kind of deals with that. He says, follow my decrees and be careful to obey my laws and you'll have safety in the land. Then the land will yield its fruit and you'll eat your fill and live there safely, in safety. You may ask, just like we did, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. While you plant during the eighth year, you'll eat from the old crop and will continue to eat from it until the harvest of the ninth year comes in. Now, check this out, what God's saying. This is really cool. God's saying, look, I want you to work for six years, work the land, sow seed, harvest the crops, work the land, sow seed, harvest the crops, work the land, sow seed, harvest the crops, and then in the seventh year, nothing. Here's what God says. In that sixth year, I'm gonna blow your mind. I'm gonna provide enough not only for year seven, but for year eight, and I'm gonna provide until the time that in year nine, the harvest comes in. I'm gonna give you enough for three years for you, for your family, for your servants, and for your livestock to eat from. Can you imagine that? That's just rockingly cool. I mean, you know, so it's this idea of a Sabbath, Sabbath year 
of rest. Why? Because God is teaching the nations around Israel something about himself. And he's doing it through something as beautiful as this. Then pick up with me in verse number eight. God adds to this. He says, all right, in addition to this just Sabbath year, count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years. Some of you just did the math. So that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. For it is a jubilee and is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. Now pause. He's using this phrase, right? This jubilee phrase. You're kind of going, I don't really know what that is. Well, it has an interesting etymology and it's kind of hard actually um, because it gets transliterated. In other words, transliterate means you take the word from the original language and you kind of just make it sound the same. Uh, um, for instance, in the Greek language, the Greek language for what they did when they dunked people underwater was baptizo. Therefore, we just transliterate the word and make it baptize to sound English as opposed to Greek. But we were really just kind of going on the Greek word and making up something in English that sounds like it. Well, this word actually means the sounding of a ram's horn, jubilee, the sounding of a ram's horn. But it also has with it this meaning, a freedom or a release from bondage, okay? So that's the idea of Jubilee. Now check out what God said. Here's what he said. 49 years, seven Sabbaths of sevens, so to speak. You go 49 years. On the 50th year, I want you to consecrate this and I want you to make it a proclamation of liberty to all the inhabitants of the land. Remember the inscription on the Liberty Bell. That was it. I want you to make it a proclamation of liberty. So what's gonna happen? Well, here's what's going to happen. All of those who were given land, which were the clans of Israel, the tribes would be ascribed stuff, the clans of Israel had these properties, this land that God had kind of given to them. He says, in this year, everybody goes back to their own land. In other words, you may have experienced hardship over the last number of years. You may have had to sell some of your property. You may have had to sell yourself to other people to work. You may have had to sell some of your family to other people to work in Israel. You may have had to sell your livestock and all this kind of stuff. He says, look, on the 50th year, redo, reset. Everybody goes back to their property. Everybody goes back to their stuff. And God just gives this great kind of reset. Slaves, so to speak, it was really hired workers because uh, Leviticus 25 kind of gives you the context for what that is. It's not slavery in the, in the uh, grotesque sense that we've seen uh, in the United States in, in the 1800s and even prior to that that was racial slavery. This is more of um, selling yourself to work for someone else and how that needs to be done in proper order. And Leviticus 25 outlines all that and I won't get to it all today. So you've got slaves, so to speak, that would be set free debts that would be forgiven, land that would be given back. Everybody would kind of get this great reset, this kind of brand new start. That was the idea behind the year of Jubilee. Now, as this played out kind of um, practically, I want you to see what this did. When you've got this Jubilee year, this 50th year in place, it does some things to the way that the people of Israel treat one another. Pick up in verse 13. In the year of Jubilee, everyone's to return to his own property. If you sell land to one of your countrymen or buy any from him, do not take advantage of each other. You are to buy from your countrymen on the basis of the number of years since the Jubilee. And he is to sell you on the basis of the number of years left for harvesting crops. When the years are many, you're to increase the price. And when the years are few, you are to decrease the price because what he is really selling you is the number of crops. Do not take advantage of each other, but fear your God 
I am the Lord your God. So what did this do? The Jubilee that God put into place for his people, you know what it did? It helped to keep the people of Israel from undue length of oppression of any of the rest of the people of Israel. In other words, there might be some oppression that goes on in Israel where somebody has hardship and they have to sell their stuff, but there's coming a time where that's gonna change. There's gonna be a redo. There's gonna be a reset button, so to speak. So you can't oppress people forever. Even if you're doing it somewhat, there's something built into this people that says, you are not to take advantage of your brother and sister. You are to show respect for the dignity of the people that you, uh, of the people of God. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So if we understand Jubilee and the Sabbath year and all these things to be teaching the nations around Israel something about the heart and character of God, I would pose this question. What story did Jubilee tell the nations? What story was Jubilee telling the nations? What were the nations learning about God as a distinct, holy, different God than their gods? What were they learning about the character and nature of God? I'm gonna give you just a couple of things. Uh, I could probably give you a boatload more, but I'm gonna give you just a few, and then we're gonna look at some things from an application standpoint, all right? Here's the first one. The first uh, story it was telling is that everything is God's, and God can be trusted. Everything is his, and he can be trusted. So functionally, what God is saying is this. Land, people, crops, livestock, financial, pro everything, it's mine, and I can be trusted. So if I tell you to, hey, Israel, if I tell you, leave the land alone in year number seven, then leave it alone. Why? Because it's all mine, and I can be trusted, and I'll provide. And because I can be trusted, we are gonna show the nations all over the place that the God you serve provides. That the God you serve can be trusted. Everything is God's, and God can be trusted. Land, money, people, anything. Here's the second thing. Jubilee told the nations that hope and justice aren't too far away. Think about this. Jubilee was to be the controlling narrative of Israel. In other words, you fall on hard times. You're struggling. You know, in our context, we'd say we lost our job or we lost our homes or we lost whatever. <clears throat> They've fallen on hard times. They've had to sell their property. It's their family property. And they've had to sell their property. And they've had to sell themselves to other clans to be able to work for them as a hired hand. But guess what? There's always light at the end of the tunnel for Israel because there is always staring in the face of all of these people, Jubilee. It's coming. It may be 40 years away or it may be two, but it's coming. What you know is this, hope and justice might look like it's far removed, but it's not too far away. It's not so far away that we get depressed and despondent and go, what's gonna happen to my life? I don't know what I'm gonna do. Everything's blown up. Life has caved in on me. God says, hope and justice aren't too far away. You know why? Because I have set Jubilee in your midst. Always at the end of the tunnel, there's light. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture, actually, that what God is painting to the nations, that you don't have to be completely and utterly despondent because God can be trusted. Everything's his and he can be trusted. And hope and justice, they're not too far away because God is controlling everything through this narrative of Jubilee and there's going to be a great reset. Everything is going to become new. Amen. I know. Amen. And I'm just now getting going. <laughs> there's lots more I can't wait to tell you. Here's a third thing. Because this, this, this is kind of like, a, this is like an airplane sermon. I don't know if I've ever told you what that is. It's kind of you, you taxi for a while before you take off. Um, and that's what kind of, this will start to land and it's gonna increasingly in waves begin to land on you. And uh, I love it. Third thing, what story did Jubilee tell the nations? Told this story that God's economy is more relational than financial. God's economy is more relational than fi financial. Do you remember when this day of Jubilee began or when this year of Jubilee began? We, we read about it just a few minutes ago. On the day of, right, the day of atonement. That's when the Jubilee started. 
So with the announcement with the trumpet of the Day of Atonement, it was also an introduction on the 50th year to the year of Jubilee. Why is that correlation important? I'll tell you why. Because God's economy is more relational than financial. Everything for the, day, for the year of Jubilee begins with the idea that we need to be rightly related to God and rightly related to people. Because God's concern is our loving him and worshiping him in the ways that he has designed and in loving people as he wants us to love one another. Love God, love people. This is the economy of God. Yes, there are some things economically or uh, financially that go on in this process, but it is so that people are, are uh, given dignity and people aren't oppressed and people aren't taken advantage of and that everybody's going to get a second chance or or maybe a third chance if they live that long. They might get a second chance or a third chance or whatever. They've got opportunity and chances and those kinds of things. God is demonstrating his grace in the midst of this jubilee idea. And he's showing that his economy is not just financial. It's relational. And there are financial things that help to supplement the reality of what he's saying. Be rightly related to me and be rightly related to one another. Thus, the picture of Jubilee year beginning on the day of atonement. So, here's the thing. Israel, as we study history, what we don't find, listen to this, this is really unique. What we don't find is we really don't find Israel having honored and observed the Jubilee year. Now, they might have for a couple of Jubilee years, you know, those 50-year intervals, maybe toward the very beginning they did, but we really don't have much record historically that they actually honored what God put into place so that his people would be able to show the nations his heart and his character. What's interesting about that is God was really serious about this idea. He was really serious about this idea of Jubilee, about re releasing people from bondage of their debts and, and, and reestablishing them in their own land where they were really designed to be and in getting them out of you know, the bondage of slavery of whatever. You know? All of these things were really important. And it was also important that the land rested in this process because he had put into place the Sabbath year of rest. Why do I tell you that it's important that Israel did not observe these things? Because you see it a little bit later on. When um, Israel went into captivity in Babylon, do you remember that later on? They went into captivity in Babylon. Do you remember how many years that was for? 70. Somebody said it, and I'm going to just, good work. Um, it was 70 years, right? You hate when I ask those questions. You're like, I'm not answering out loud. Because A, you might know my name, and you might go, hey, Joe, that was, no, the stupid answer, dude. Bring your Bible, go read the Bible. You know, I'm not gonna do that to you. 70 years, right? 70 years they were gonna be in captivity in Babylon. And do you know what the chronicler teaches us and says to us? It's really interesting. It reminds us that God has not forgotten. Listen to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Uh, God carried into exile, to, or he carried into exile the ba to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword. And they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation, it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Do you know what some scholars actually think? Some scholars actually think that from the time that Israel stopped observing the rest for the land and Jubilee and all that kind of stuff, it was 490 years until they were exiled into Babylon. And so God allowed them to be exiled for 70 years so that each one of those years was representative of a Sabbath year that they did not let the land rest and that he had not forgotten what he wanted to do with his people. Are you catching this? There's more. God was serious about this idea of Jubilee and he hadn't forgotten about it and you can see the chronicler giving us indication of that. But guess what? Even during this period of exile to Babylon, during the, the maybe latter part of that, a guy, a prophet named Isaiah was prophesying during that time. And guess what? God was speaking through Isaiah and reminding everybody he has not forgotten about this idea of Jubilee where debts are forgiven 
where people go back to the original place that they were, where people are no longer under bondage. God has not forgotten. Even if Israel has, God has not forgotten. And through Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 61, listen to these words. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom or liberty for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners, listen to this, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you know what that is? Say it. Jubilee. Jubilee. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. God is even speaking through his prophets saying, I have not forgotten about this acceptable, this favorable, this blessed year of the Lord called Jubilee that I put into place. And God is promising through Isaiah that 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 is going to happen, which makes it even more remarkable that when this young rabbi named Jesus went back into his hometown in Nazareth and began to be asked as a guest rabbi in his own home synagogue where he grew up, he was asked, as was the custom, to be able to read or to preach basically a message from the scroll he was handed. Notice what Luke 4 says happened in that time. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Isn't that interesting? Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stopped. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, Listen, some of you may be getting what I'm about to tell you. Jesus shows up in Nazareth, is handed the scroll of Isaiah, unravels it. It didn't have chapter markers. He finds this place. He reads it to them and he says, he's here to release the captives, to free everybody, to do all of these things and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus says, I am fulfilling this. I am the Jubilee. Now, Jesus is in effect saying, The king of the kingdom has shown up in your midst. And I have come to proclaim that you can get free from the sin that holds you in bondage. That I can release you from all of your debts. That I can make everything new and reset you into the image in which you were designed that has been marred by sin, but I can make it all brand new. This is Jesus who's saying, I am the Jubilee for you. Yep. Oh yeah, I'm not done. I'm telling you, we're ramping up. Yeah, I, gotta, I need some water. Pardon me a moment. Now, if we are students of the Bible, and we are, and if we are brilliant students of the Bible, and you are, I'm giving you credit, then what we read in Luke 4 about Jesus proclaiming to be the Jubilee, we would not have been surprised by that had we started reading in the very beginning of the Gospels. You see, my man Matthew, who's the first Gospel that we have in our chronology, so to speak, of the canon of Scripture, my man Matthew wrote from a very Jewish perspective. And you almost don't know what Matthew's up to until you get to chapter two because Matthew starts unpacking this idea even with the the Christmas narratives that we read. He's unpacking this idea of Jesus as the king, right? That's kind of the thematic side of the book of Matthew that Jesus is the king. 
But he's trying to help us understand that this king of the kingdom is also jubilee in the flesh. How do I know that? He gives us a hint. And of all places, he does it in chapter one, which is just a chronology of like all these people from who Jesus came from that you skip over every time you read it. Matthew chapter one, verse 17 says this. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Christ. Pause with me, look at me, you're going, okay, that didn't help me, Jerry, thanks. Three sets of 14s. Let me say it differently. Six sets of sevens. With Jesus being the seventh seven. The Jubilee. Isn't that cool? You see, you start, this, you get messed up when you read the Bible. You start reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit start, you just start going, whoa, whoa, whoa. What just, I read, what, what? Right, that's what I do. Like when I'm sitting by myself, it's just like, what, get rid of now. This is just, this is part of the beauty of what we're trying to see in the scripture, that Jesus himself is our Jubilee. And do you know what I know? Listen, oh, the early church understood that. The first Christians, were they British? No. Were they American? No. What were they? Jewish. And they understood this idea that Jesus is the Jubilee. Do you know how I know? Because of the choices that they made when they first embraced Jesus in how they lived. Listen to Acts chapter two and what it says about the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Listen to Acts 4. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. They shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. You know why? Because they understood something. Jesus has canceled our debt. Jesus has made everything new. Jesus owns everything. We're not the owners of anything. And here in the midst of our persecution, as we have followed Jesus, we can live out the reality of the Jubilee because Jesus, our Jubilee, lives in us and we can show it by saying, this isn't my own, I'll care for you and you'll care for me. Man, it is a beautiful picture. Now, so how do we do this? How do we apply the idea of a Jubilee lifestyle? How does that work for us? Well, here's what I'd encourage you to do. I would encourage you to maybe um, flash back to those three kind of principles that I gave you about what Jubilee tells to the nations and then start thinking about ways in which you could apply that personally. You remember the first one? We said everything is God's and he can be trusted, right? Amen. So what does that mean for you? Well, for some of you, you need to answer the ownership question. You've never answered the ownership question. You still think your stuff is yours. You're still under the fantasy that everything that you have is yours. Well, I worked for it, Jerry. You worked for it because God gave you health. God gave you a body. God gave you opportunity. God gave you everything you have. It is all God's. And God can be trusted. Some of us don't even give because we don't trust. We, don't act, we act like I've got to hoard everything I have because I can't trust God by investing my resources into eternal things. And God says, I'll provide for you when you do that, but you've got to trust me in the process. I've gone from talking to preaching at this point. All right, now. But, but this is what we need to grab hold of. If we want to actually understand what it means to live jubilee lifestyles, we start asking the question, everything is God's and God can be trusted, then what does that mean for me? Maybe it means we got to learn how to start sharing. We got to start helping. 
Whatever. I mean, you can make the application and I'll trust the spirit of God. Maybe you got to just, maybe you got to ratchet down your consumption because you're leaving, listen, you're leaving nothing on the edges of your fields. You've got no margin because you're consuming it all on yourself and you can't even be generous because you've left nothing on the edge of your fields like holy people do. I'm coming out of my microphone. There's a second, hey, here's the second one. What did we talk about? Hope and justice aren't too far away, right? How, how do we apply that? I don't know. Maybe you need to adopt a child that has no, that has no opportunity, that's in a place of hopelessness. Maybe you're fo- you need to foster a kid. Maybe you say, well, I'm too old. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't do that. Maybe you can come alongside and resource a family that is doing it. You can say, I tell you what, I know this is gonna be a big sacrifice for you guys. I'm gonna outfit your nursery for you. I'm just talking creatively and out of my mind because my brother has got me all messed up on this whole adoptive thing because he's just started a ministry where he is helping churches care for, a, uh, care for orphans around the world and helping churches to do that. And now he's got me all jacked up. Now, I, I don't know what it is for you. What does it mean for hope and justice to be on the way? Maybe for you it means that uh, you're gonna advocate, advocate for people who can't advocate for themselves. Uh, maybe you've got disadvantaged people that don't know how to, uh, how to help themselves and you're gonna be able to step in and somehow minister to them. Maybe you can mentor a child. Uh, we do that at, uh, at Renovation Church all the time. You can see some pictures that are, that are up here on the screen. We, we've got an Excel Leadership Center where we are actually helping children in that neck of the woods that are in a really disadvantaged part of the city of Buffalo. And we're helping them after school learn how to read and write and use computers and do their homework and maybe have some opportunity. And guess what? We had more children sign up than we've got mentors available. We don't have enough people to help meet the need. And it's just one time a week. Maybe that's how we can bring hope and justice into the midst of our world. I don't, I'm, listen, you don't have to go with any of those. You, you can let the Spirit of God teach you something. Let the Spirit of God show you something. I don't know what it is. I'm looking at Dave Buds and I think about Potter's Hands and all the things that they're doing. Amen. Ministering to people in that way. Uh, motivated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Having an opportunity to share and show the love of Jesus Christ. I mean, just let the Spirit of God lead you in this. If you don't interact with the Word of God, I can't beat it into you, and I'm not going to try. You've got to let God show you what it means to live a Jubilee lifestyle. What does that look like? Let me give you the third thing that I said in here is that God's economy is more relational than it is financial, right? How do we apply that? Well, I'll give you a quick illustration. I was in New York City and I was speaking to a number of different pastors in a number of different places, meeting with them about some of the nature of of what we're doing in the mission in New York City. Uh, We have a number of our guys, uh, Ryan Cozy does that some from our church. And uh, so we we got a number of people that kind of weigh in on that, but I was in New York City and I was meeting with a pastor there named J.R. Vassar. J.R. pastors um, a church called Apostles Church. He's doing a fantastic job. He's about my age, maybe slightly younger. Um, and, and he's cooler actually too, which is not really hard to do. Um, he's doing a fantastic job. Great teacher of the Bible. We're out to lunch. Just a, just a handful of us. We're out to lunch. This waitress comes up and she comes over to JR and says, I know you. And he kind of just smiled and he called her by name. I, I don't remember her name. I'm just making it up. Like Rachel, how are you? I was like, dude, this is New York City. You know, there's like, this isn't Alden. You know what I mean? It's New York City. There's a lot of people there. So she leaves and she just gave him that. Yeah, I know you. And that was it. So she leaves after that little interchange and I kind of went, hey bro, uh, cough it up. What's, give me the backstory here. What's this all about? He wasn't going to say nothing. I was like, dude, tell me what the deal is. So he says, well, I was in here a few weeks ago and this waitress, I had this waitress and, you know, learned her name and whatever, but she blew my order to smithereens. I mean, horribly. Like, please no onions and I just get an onion sandwich. It's one of those kind of things, right? 
And I think he said, I can't remember exactly, but I think he said something along the line of, she messed his order up like two or three times. I mean, just like having to go back, completely, totally wrong. I think to the point that maybe everybody else had already finished their lunch and he hasn't even gotten his lunch. And I don't know how apologetic she was or whatever. It's New York City, right? I don't know how apologetic she was or whatever. I'm not really sure. But every, virtually every other person on planet Earth would have known she's getting what's coming to her. Squat. I'm gonna pay the bill, but she ain't getting nothing. He gave her a ridiculous tip. Like, ridiculous tip, not even just, hey, that was a generous, ridiculous tip. And I said, why'd you do that? He said, because it seemed like she may have needed to learn of grace. And I was like, dude, that is Jubilee living. Where maybe everybody else, including maybe people sitting under the sound of my voice, would have stuck it to her because she didn't serve me like she was supposed to serve me. Instead, JR knew the deep reality that he is not owed squat, that he doesn't deserve squat. And as a result, because he has been shown incredible grace by the God who has shown him grace in Jesus, our jubilee that's released him from bondage, given him a new life, poured on him blessing after blessing, that he can do the same thing for people that don't deserve it either. Because God's economy is more relational than financial. I don't, I don't know how you apply that. You know, For some of you, you know what it means? Because it's more relational to financial, it means you need to forgive somebody. You need to release them. You, you've been hanging on to it for a long time and you know in your heart of hearts, you've been hanging on to bitterness and unforgiveness and you know how to talk the talk. Oh, I forgave them a long time ago. But you still talk so bad about them, which is indicative of the fact that you didn't really forgive them. You just gave lip service to forgiving them. You need to get fresh with God and allow that heart to be opened up before him and say, God, I know that your kingdom is relational. And I know that that means that I'm to be rightly related to you and rightly related to people. Where do I need to honor you? So those are some individual ways, but uh, there's also a way that our church can live out the reality of Jubilee. And I want you to listen to what I'm about to tell you. We've been having a conversation probably over the last about, uh, it's been over 18 months, not quite two years, where the leaders here at um, the, the Cross Point campus and leaders at our Renovation Church campus have been having an ongoing dialogue about what does our relationship look like best for the future of kingdom ministry in the city? Now, for those of you that don't know, Renovation Church is a church that we launched here at the chapel, a church we planted that is still affiliated, a part of the chapel, into really with an eye toward the city. They're ministering now to, to over 600 people on average a week on Sundays. I mean, that by itself, Renovation Church is now one of the top 25 largest congregations in Western New York now. I mean, you just go, what? What just happened there? And they are reaching people, many of which have significant need need that maybe some of us are privileged not to have, but have significant need. And so they're teaching adults how to read and write. They're teaching some adults how to build a resume to try and find a job and helping them with skills to be able to do that. And they're doing all of this centered on the gospel. They're helping kids do the same thing. They're feeding people. They're, it's a wonderful opportunity for ministry. But we've been praying about, thinking about, dialoguing about what's in the best interest of this going forward because ultimately all we care about and all they care about is what's best for the kingdom. What is the best opportunity for the kingdom? And we came to the conclusion, us here, our leadership here, our board here, and them, that the best opportunity is for them to become their own entity, not formally still affiliated with the chapel. Now listen. The reason we come to that is because they have opportunity maybe to get a variety of grants from foundations and things like that for some of the work that they're doing. But when people and foundations see that they are a part of us, 
they kind of like, well, dude, right? You're part of this big church and kind of all that stuff. So it actually might help them to be on their own. Plus, it's kind of was started as an independent style ministry anyway from the very outset. So we kind of came to that conclusion that this would be in the best interest of the kingdom going forward for them to be able to do that. But what we would remain, the chapel, we would remain in a strategic partnership, which means this. We still continue to, um, to give financial resource to them in an agreement, long, long-term agreement. We still continue to provide expertise and support where they need it. And we continue to be able to, um, to send volunteers their way to help serve things like I just showed you, you know, at Excel Leadership Center, all of those kinds of things. So when we moved to the campus where we are now, Hurdle and St. Florian, what we did is this, is the chapel purchased what was a former Catholic campus, Catholic church campus. And so we, we bought it for ministry for renovation church so that they could be operating in, out of it. So now that we've come to this place where we've said, we feel like it is in the best interest for the two to now, for them to officially become their own entity. They're a church of 600 plus for them to become their own entity, which will benefit their ministry in the city, for us to continue our strategic partnership with them, then we got the opportunity to ask the question, what would it look like to live Jubilee with them? So, we don't want to be landlords. We, the chapel, own that property. And what I'm going to be asking members of the chapel to affirm in just a few moments is that we sell that property to them for the sum of zero dollars. Hmm. Here's what's something that's interesting. When I planned the series on Leviticus, we had not come to a decision related to renovation. But once we came to that, I realized I'm gonna be preaching on Jubilee. And I started thinking, uh-oh. God's got us in a corner here. You know what else I thought about? This is just kind of just one of those little freaky things. Don't have to read too much in, but the mystics around here will. Our church this year, 50 years. <laughs> All right, I'll admit it. I'm a little bit of a mystic. We're 50 years old. And you know what we want to do? We own the property outright. We don't owe anything on it. Here it is. So that, so that you can reach people who don't have much opportunity sometimes. So that they can see God's economy is more relational than it is financial. So that people in Northwest Buffalo can see that hope and justice, they're not too far away. So that people can see that everything is God's. And he can be trusted. So, I've done this twice and it's just eating my lunch. I love it so much. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna get you out of here close to on time in the same general time that we normally do. But the band's coming out now and I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do. And so please listen and please do it out of just kindness, respect, grace, and yeah, all those things. I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna stand you up and we're gonna sing together a song that you don't know yet but we're gonna teach you. And it's about how everything's God's. All right, that's what we're gonna sing. And I hope you can sing it from your heart. You'll be learning it. But, and we do that because God's holy. He's distinct. He's different. And then at a point when the song finishes, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna give you some instruction. And so I, I'd ask you to wait until I get back up here to give you some instruction. And then we're going to be done with what all we're doing reasonably quickly. So... Will you do that for me? Yes. Bills don't play till four. <laughs> so everybody just chill out. 
Stand with me as I pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you've shown us today. Um, we're stunned at, at the marvel of your word. We're stunned, frankly, at the marvel of the revelation of your word because what it does is it teaches us about you, God. Not just words on a page that we go, oh, wow, that was a cool insight, but this is a God in the heavens that we get to know. Jesus, you're our jubilee. Everything is yours. And I pray that we would bless you in our singing and that we would bless you in the choices that we make to live jubilee lifestyles. We ask in Jesus' name.